and here we go. Good evening, everybody. Hello and welcome. Thank you so much for joining us here. My name is McKaylee. I'm with Tattered Cover Bookstore. And before I say anything else, the first thing I want to say to you is thank you. Thank you for being here in our virtual community. We are normally known for being a communal space where um, everybody works uh, together and can come together and get their books signed and, and just be with one another. And in this way, we're being with each other virtually because we can't be together in person. Tattered Cover is a local independent bookstore here in Denver, Colorado. And we are, have been around now for 50 years. It is our 50th anniversary here in 2021, which is incredible to think about. And the reason that we've been around this long is because of you, because of our community, both in person and virtual. We wouldn't be here without you. And we want to say thank you for that. And thank you for joining us tonight. We are in for such a treat. Uh, I'm personally very excited. This has not been the first CJ Box event that we've hosted, the first one virtually, but uh, he is well known in our bookstores and well loved. Um, I wanna let you know and give you a couple of housekeeping things before we get started. For those of you who may want it or need it, closed captioning is available. There's a black bar down at the bottom of the screen with a button labeled CC on it. Click that button and closed captioning is enabled should you want it or need it. Also, Tattered Cover is open to the public right now. As long as you come in wearing your mask over your mouth and your nose, you can come visit us for about 90 minutes or so at any of our four locations in the Denver metro area. But if you're like me and you want to stay shopping in your pajamas or you're not located uh, in the Denver metro area, you can shop online with us at tatteredcover.com. And that's open 24-7 for you. Also on tatteredcover.com, you can check out all of our virtual events that we have up and coming. It is crazy, the schedule. Literally at 6.30 tonight, we have another event with Joe Ide. So you, registrations are still open for that with his new book, Smoke. And later in the month, we have debut author Gregory Brown with his new book, The Lowering Days, which I'm telling you, if you're a fan of CJ Box, you'll like this book too. So check that out at tatteredcover.com slash event. And now I want to introduce our guests this evening. This is really special because uh, Lisa Casper is actually the moderator for this event, who's going to be in conversation with CJ Box. And Lisa Casper works at Douglas County Libraries, and she's hosted every single one of CJ Box's events at Tattered Cover. So we would be remiss to not have her host his virtual one as well. And then our author of the hour, CJ Box is the number one New York Times bestselling author of 20 Joe Pickett novels, seven standalone novels, and story collections, Shots Fired. He's won the Edgar, Anthony, McCavity, Gumshoe, and two Barry Awards, the 2010 Mountains and Plains Independent Booksellers Association Award for Fiction, as well as the French Prix Calibre 38, <laughs> Calibre 38 and a French L Magazine Literary Award. He was awarded the 2016 Western Heritage Award for Literature by the National Cowboy Museum and the Spur Award from the Western Writers of America for Best Contemporary Novel. Over 7 million copies of his books have been sold in the US and abroad. His books have been translated into 30 languages and have been options for film and television. His television series adapted from Box's Dassey, Cassie Duel novels, excuse me, by David E. Kelly, Big Sky, will come back to ABC in April. A Wyoming native, Box has also worked on a ranch and is a small town newspaper reporter and editor. He and his wife, Lori, live on their ranch in Wyoming. And it is my honor to welcome both CJ and Lisa here tonight. And we'll have them turn on their cameras and their microphones so they can get started. There we go. Perfect, there's Lisa. Hello, Lisa. <laughs> We're getting CJ on here. Maybe in a minute. There it goes. Working one thing at a time here. There he is. Hello. You guys are still muted here. If you want to click those on real quick, there's CJ. Hello there. Lisa. Hi, guys. Hello. <laughs> here to and talk about the book. book. I got the book. Congratulations. Thank you. Yeah, it just came out yesterday. So this is this is terrific. Happy book birthday then. That's wonderful. Thank you. Yeah, absolutely. Well, I am going to step out and let the two of you take it away. I want to just remind our viewers that we are going to be hosting a Q&A session at the end of this. Some of you have already been active in the chat that's next to the screen you're watching us on, and that's where you'll be able to ask your questions. So I'll be back, back later to help facilitate those. But for now, take it away, you two. Well, CJ, it's great to see you again, and congratulations on Dark Sky. I read it in one day. It was amazing. I loved every minute of it. And now I can't wait till next March. So 
Why don't you tell us a little bit about the book and sure. how it came to be? First, um, thanks for doing this, Lisa. We've got a, we've got a good thing going. Um, 28 events in a row. This is by far the weirdest. Yes. But, um, <laughs> hopefully it will be the only one like this we ever have to do. Yes. Um, sure. Dark Sky uh, is the 21st Joe Pickett novel. It's it amazes me to say that because um, it's been it's been it doesn't seem like that. But I know um, <laughs> in this book, uh, Joe Pickett is he's our, our our Wyoming game warden is is tasked by the governor of Wyoming, um, who he doesn't get along with all that well, to um, basically be an elk hunting guide for uh, a billionaire Silicon Valley social media mogul and his entourage. Um, Joe doesn't really do that. He didn't want to do it, but uh, the governor makes it clear that if he doesn't, um, he's likely to lose his job and the agency might go away. So Joe's doing it on his behalf and all of his colleagues. So the jet arrives in Saddle String and within just a few hours, he's got the mogul named Steve Price and, his, and two of his Steve Price's assistants on horseback. Um, they've also got a local outfitter going along and they head into the mountains. And um, of course, things go awry fairly quickly. And um, this novel, uh, when I started it, you know, I kind of had in mind the idea of stripping everything down to the studs, even though it's got a very high tech kind of uh, background and a lot of talk about social media, the danger of social media, the all pervasiveness of being online all the time. Um, it, you know, all those things that we're talking about. In fact, a lot of things that are in the news right now about cancer, yeah. cult, cancel culture and um, deplatforming and humiliating people online. Um, those things are all discussed. But to me, it was all about the juxtaposition of um, all this high tech out there. But in the wilderness, um, everything's stripped down to just basic survival. And it doesn't take long with Joe in the mountains before that's exactly what it is. It's um, it's a wilderness survival tale. Um, and Joe finds himself without weapons or transportation or communication in any way. And it's just him versus some men who are hunting both he and Steve Price. Um, snow starts snowing. Um, he, he's got to get down. He's got to somehow avoid uh, the people who are after him. And he's got to use his wits. Uh, and it all takes place over just three short days, really. Two and a half, actually. Um, meanwhile, Nate Romanowski, who has tried very hard to domesticate and go straight, uh, has a new baby at home. Um, he's learning the difference between different brands of Pampers. Um, and he's yeah. now employing Sheridan Pickett, uh, Joe's Pickett's older daughter, as his uh, uh, apprentice falconer. But they find out fairly quickly that somebody has been encroaching on his territory meaning um, stealing uh, fledgling falcons from nests, taking eggs, and soon going to move in on Nate's own birds. And turns out it's kind of a, ver a younger version of Nate, but much more ruthless. Um, so those two storylines are going on at the same time. And of course, they kind of come together in the end in a, kind of a wild conclusion, I think. Yes. <laughs> we won't <laughs> talk much about that, but it was wild. <laughs> For sure. Well, I, I was interested in the fact that um, you kind of have Joe, he's aging and uh, he's a bit out of his, uh, the elk hunt leading is fine, but all the computer stuff and, and social media stuff is sort of foreign to him. And he has no idea really who this man is, who's like uh, huge with every other age group. Um, there is. And uh, I just really like the way you portray him getting older and kind of coming into this, you know, still naive in a way, but not, but not totally unprepared. Yeah. He's, uh, he's 51 in this novel and uh, he feels every one of those years when he climbs off the horse after the first night and everything hurts. Um, and, and he's still, you know, after all these years, He's still basically the same guy. He's gotten more mature. He's gotten a little, uh, a little harder bark on him than he did originally. Um, gotten a little bit more cynical, but um, still the same Joe. And um, I, the interaction between Joe and Steve Price, I, I, I loved writing that. Um, 
Joe is not, he's no whiz at social media like his daughters and his wife are. So um, it's all new to him, or at least unfamiliar to him. And um, I think he asked some good questions, but at the same time, I think Steve Price, who's never been out of his Silicon Valley bubble before, um, is seeing a whole different world too, uh, for good and worse. That's for sure. <laughs> I also like the way um, you've written Mary Beth and in the last several novels, uh, helping, hit, helping Joe along the way of finding things out. And like you said, she's very computer savvy and can dig up stuff that is remarkable, really. And I, I love that you've changed her. Was there kind of just, was this sort of always in the plan or how did that come about? No, you just like her because she's a librarian. I do. You know that. <laughs> <laughs> no, uh, she, in, in quite a few of the books, she's been involved kind of in the background. Um, in this one, because Joe is totally isolated, um, she has to take everything. She has to take control of the situation. Um, she realizes before anybody else does that, that something has happened because there's been absolutely no communication at all. So she enlists Sheridan, who's even better at social media, and they start to figure out that it's been quite a while since Steve Price has posted something on his site. Therefore, something has gone wrong, horribly wrong. And uh, if it wasn't for Mary Beth, um, you know, there's no way that Joe would have a chance. Yeah, that's that's true. I love their partnership. I've, I've always liked how you've written it. Um, it just is it's sort of like coming home when I come home to read Joe Pickett. You know, it's sort of like <laughs> my neighbors or something. So um, speaking of which, I know that uh, your Cassie Duell and Cody Hoyt books were optioned and in fact made into Big Sky on ABC, which is coming back in April. What about Joe Pickett? You were is that in development as well? Well, I, I, I'm, I'm walking a fine line because I, okay. I've, I have made a deal with the, the uh, producers that I would not make an official announcement. So I'm not okay. making an official announcement. But um, any day now, there will be an official announcement. Um, I'm, I'm very excited about it. Uh, things are happening. I like the people involved. Um, I like the character who's been picked to play Joe Pickett, who I can't reveal. As, but so I'm very excited about that. It's kind of bizarre to think that next year there may be two different television shows on the air um, with all of my characters, basically. But um, what I found, in, especially with, with Big Sky, and I think it'll happen even to a greater degree later, is that... Um, I, we look at we look at TV or movies as um, big commercials for the books. Not yes. it doesn't mean anything more than that, other than more people are exposed and they may want to seek out um, the, the the source material. And that's that's in fact happened already with Big Sky. the The book, the Cassie Duel books, have increased in sales by twenty times in the last that's two wonderful. months. Um, that's excellent. And, <laughs> and the Joe Pickett books have increased, uh, the backlist has gone up 30% in the last year. And I think that's simply because there are people who see this stuff and they want to know where it came from and they get interested. And that's the best reward of all. Mm -hmm. And they're so readable and engaging both series. It's, it's wonderful. So I'm, I'm really happy to hear that. And we will watch this space for the big announcements. Yeah. So, yeah. That sounds good. Um, so how was it being an executive producer for Big Sky? <laughs> Whatever that means. <laughs> I'm, yeah, I'm often asked that. And it, it sounds glib, but it's true. Um, executive producer means, in this case, um, I, I provide the source material, the books, and then I cash the checks that they send me. And that's basically my involvement. Um, I've not been to the set. It's in Vancouver. Um, for COVID reasons, I can't visit because I don't want to quarantine for two weeks in right. Canada. Um, even David E. Kelly, who, who developed and wrote the first 10 episodes, has never visited the set himself uh, for the same reason. So it's, it's kind of a bizarre situation to have a TV show. It's even more bizarre to have one set in a bubble that is inaccessible. But um, as you mentioned, the, the, the it's ABC's uh, biggest new series, biggest new drama. And um, I think 
it's weird because it used to be, you know, when, when a show came on, you'd know the next day of the overnight ratings, how, you know, how did it do? And it did fine in the overnight ratings, but three weeks later, the viewership on it through streaming services, Hulu and ABC.com and all of Amazon prime um, had grown from 4.5 million to I think 18.7 million viewers, um, maybe even more than that. So it's, it's really, it's doing well. well that's excellent. So um, on the tech guy, do you see a lot of the tech billionaires coming to Wyoming and trying to get but, tours and fishing guides and all that? <laughs> there, there have definitely been a few. And, uh, uh, and that during this pandemic, there's been a lot of interesting visitors to Wyoming. Um, I bet. It's, it, Wyoming has been kind of a bubble of its own. I mean, it, there have been restrictions, but um, based on most places, they've been absolutely mild. Um, it's hard to it's hard to remember sometimes what's that there's a pandemic going on. And I, I joke to my my New York editor who's been in his apartment with his kids sent for 11 months. I said, you know, it's tough out here, too, because uh, you know, it's really hard some days to find somebody to social distance with. So I understand your pain. So I'm just kidding. But um, <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> what was the original question? I just wondered if you, you, you answered it. It was how many interesting people are coming to Wyoming that are, you know, oh, first time in the wilderness types. You know, there, there has been a big surge in um, an interest, uh, especially in millennials um, who for the first time are hunting and fishing. Uh, part of it is, I think, the pandemic, and it starts. I think part of it is um, it reminds people that you know they need to fend for themselves sometimes, yeah. and they never thought about it. There were more fishing licenses purchased in Wyoming last year than in history, out of state. Um, half the state of Colorado, I think, spent the summer yeah. there. Uh, <laughs> so, it, it, and um, in this case, I, the 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 character is a little bit based. Um, it's no secret, a little bit on Mark Zuckerberg who um, is kind of well known for taking every year and devoting it to a certain thing he wants to learn. Mm -hmm. um, one year he learned Mandarin Chinese and um, there was a year where he wanted to procure all of his own food. And there's a story about another big high tech guy um, coming over to Zuckerberg's house for lunch and Zuckerberg going out into his backyard and killing a goat so they can eat. So um, th th it's, it was sort of based on that. Um, and the, our guy, Steve Price, wants to find out what it's like, what it feels like to get his own protein, basically. Right. Um, so it's not that far out of the realm of reality. Mm -hmm. um, during this whole COVID mess, I, I know you have a pretty strict writing routine. Did it change or why, why don't you tell us about how, how you work every day? No, it, it, it did not change. In fact, um, I've never been more productive in my life. Um, I'm so far ahead. I nearly have the next Joe Pickett book done already. Oh, thank um, I'm God. Gonna, I'm going to start on a Cassie Duell book immediately after that. So, um, you know, you know, my life, at least my, my writing life is very much isolation anyway. Um, I, mm -hmm. I have a, an office on the top of our horse barn. I walk out there every day and I work. And without any travel, without any um, in-person events anywhere, I've had even more time. And that's mm -hmm. always been the biggest problem is uh, having enough time to, to devote to things. So um, I have some author friends who have been absolutely paralyzed for 11 mm. months. Um, I'm exactly the opposite. I, I don't have any distractions. So I've been able to get a lot done and I think good stuff too. And I, in fact, I'm going to be able to have my second guilt-free summer of fishing and golf because I will be done with the next book. I'm excited. That sounds great. <laughs> <laughs> sounds great for us readers, too. <laughs> um, on, the, on the next book, or on Nate Romanowski, actually, I wanted to talk about, he's, mm -hmm. like you said, he's changed. He's, he's got a partner, and they have a child, and he's trying to behave himself. But, of course, the world doesn't let him. Um, how's How's that been writing him into a more family oriented guy for you? It's been very enjoyable. Um, I, I really, I mean, he's still Nate and he's still Nate yes. deep down, um, but I, I think he's finding that his life is richer in ways that he never imagined. 
And um, he's absolutely head over heels um, about his new little grand or his little daughter. Um, I I was kind of maybe readers can tell us, but I was a, I was a little bit hesitant on have, taking him that direction because Nate is Nate. But most readers I talked to really kind of like the change in his life and um, kind of like to see how he has developed. And he it's it's funny now because he kind of looks to Joe for guidance on how do you do this family <laughs> thing. Uh, and it, whereas the other way around, it was it, Joe was always hoping for Nate's help on things. Yeah, I liked how he is kind of developing that family sense and and being a family guy. But also he's retained, like you said, himself and his knowledge base and everything that we love about Nate. So ears included. So <laughs> yes. <laughs> so what's, what's, um, so what's next for uh, Joe Pickett? I mean, I know you're, it's kind of be a continuation of this story basically, but um, even down the line or. Sure. Um, you know, most of the books, not all of them, but most of them tend to take place a, a year after the last book you know Joe Pickett gets a year older and and so on some of them have been as short as four months the next book um we're still figuring out the title so I'm not saying that yet uh starts literally the next day after Dark Sky ends um with the thread that's kind of left open I'm not going to reveal what no. that is uh it, but it starts right just right afterwards um beyond that Lisa you know I never think in terms of long-term strategy or uh, for a couple reasons. One, I want to concentrate completely on the book I'm writing and not mm -hmm. be thinking ahead because I think then you, with, as a writer, you tend to withhold things for later, yeah. maybe. Uh, but I, I don't have a, a grand plan. Um, I think the way Joe Pickett is aging and the way I am aging, we'll be ready to retire together at some point, <laughs> but that's still a uh, ways away. Really. Yeah. And um, I still get just as excited to start a new book as, as I ever have. And um, the next one is uh, I, I'm loving it. You know, it's, sometimes I don't love them that much until later. This one I really love. And I, it's it's got a lot going on, um, including librarian stuff. So, All right. <laughs> uh, yeah, a lot of that. Uh, but so beyond that, I don't know. Um, I know that there'll be another Joe Pickett book the year after, but I, I don't have it planned out yet. I like, I like what you said there, because I know in most of your books, things are ripped from the headlines. You are very good at current events and merging them into your stories. Uh, I'm wondering what, how Cassie, what's her next move in the book you're going to be working on? Um, She's going, I, I've got, I've got a, a rough outline of the, of the Cassie book. I know where in Montana it's going to be located. I know the basic kind of setup that it's going to have. I don't have all the details down yet and I won't until I travel there. That's one, that's, that's a been bad, bad thing about the, the pandemic is I like to go to the places that I write about and just hang out um, in you know, these little towns and um, do the things that people do in the books. And so I need to go to this uh, certain place in Montana and hang out for a while. And I know the rest will just, the rest of the story will come pouring in. Mm -hmm. um, but what's, you know, might be of interest. I don't know. Uh, I've been asked a few times, you know, if, if with the TV show and TV shows, um, am I going to write in, with that in mind? And the answer is no. Um, the Ca Cassie Duel is my Cassie Duel, and my Cassie Duel will be in the next book. And I can't really think of how that might be adapted, or the actors, or anything else. I um, don't want to do that. Don't want to go that direction. Um, and I don't think, actually, I don't think the producers mind that much. They just want basic material. So right. uh, that's up to them to figure out. Yeah, and I think that I think that's a good way to be because the book, like you said earlier, is is different, and it's your story, your creation, and you've, uh, they've optioned it to utilize the, the nuts and bolts of it, but then they make their changes. And so it's really two different stories um, mm -hmm. for the, for people like me who love reading your books. And also now I'm enjoying Big Sky. I, you know, I'm like, well, there's some differences, but the actors are great. And so I just look of it, look at it like a twofer, you know? 
<laughs> yes. And, and, you know, the other thing, um, you know, of course there's changes. I knew that going in because it's the sure. TV so collaborative and so many people are involved with it and they aren't going to stick to everything on the page, but I've been, I've been pleased that the, the general storylines have been true. And frankly, there's a couple of things they did in the series. I wish I would have done in the book. Well, um, I wondered so, about that. <laughs> not all of them, but some no. of them for sure. Yeah. Yeah. There, there have been a couple that I was like, Oh, <laughs> mm -hmm. so that's, that's good. So, um, so you're on your, you're on a yearly, uh, cycle for new Joe Pickett books. So when will the Cassie dual one come about the next one of those? Well, you know, um, Weird times. My, my track record of prognostication has, is, is staying true and that I can never figure out what's going to happen. So I was able to get an additional year for the Cassie dual book than I would normally get just because the pace of doing a book and a half a year was starting to get to be much, too much. So right. of course I timed that for exactly when the TV show would come based on that character. But I'm going to, I'm actually going to start it much sooner than I had promised I would because I'm so far ahead. So <laughs> mm -hmm. it's, there's a possibility there may be a Cassie dual book next year, which is more like the original schedule, but I can't promise that, but um, I know they're anxious for it and I'm anxious to get going on it. So how's your reading been during this COVID pandemic? Are you, getting some reading in, you know, in between fishing and so forth. And well, I, I haven't been fishing because it's been too, well, too much ice is, on the river. Yes, yes. Uh, <laughs> I have been reading a lot and doing, you know, read it, doing a lot of uh, first novels uh, to blurb them. And uh, it seems like they're, uh, I've been kind of inundated with first novels and I'm, I've gotten through most of them. There's some great stuff coming down the pike. Um, uh, I was really excited by... Um, uh, Winter Counts. I think you yes. might be familiar with that book and that yes. author. Uh, Dave, Colorado uh, author too. Yeah, David yes. uh, Widely. David Heska Wombly Whedon. I, I'm glad you got the two middle names because I can never remember <laughs> them. But I was really excited by that. I, I hope to see more. And there's some other stuff that um, I've really enjoyed. But uh, right now I'm reading a, the, the last Denise Mina book. I'm a huge fan of her Scottish writer. Yeah, and, she's uh, great intend to do, you know, fiction, nonfiction, fiction, nonfiction, but I've been reading a lot more fiction, I think in the last 10 months than I normally do. Well, that's, that's good. I, I uh, had a little trouble getting reading done. I had to listen for a uh, long time, but now I'm back at, you know, just, and actually, yeah, your books really helped me get back into my reading, but for a well, while good. I was having trouble focusing. So, you know, it's, it's been different for everybody, I'm sure. So mm -hmm. um, are there any things uh, that you want to say about the book that I haven't asked you about, but, you know, I don't want to give much away, but I want to say too, that it's, um, it's so cinematic, this book, it is so visual. I could see all the horses and everything. It was just really beautifully done. And so I'm, hoping that when they make the Joe Pickett series, they, they focus on that kind of your writing. So, well, thank you. Thanks very much. I, I, I think they will having spoken to the showrunners and the producers, they want to go book by book through the series and keep it very close to um, the, the books and the order. So I'm excited about that. No, I think the only thing is um, I feel very prescient with this book because of the issues that are involved in regard to uh, the cancel culture. And um, I mentioned earlier, you know, censorship, the internet, the power of the internet. And I finished it last May before a lot of the issues that are everybody's talking about right now um, were in the forefront. And so I, I, I'm glad that's all in there. And, mm -hmm. um, and, and I like to always, I think big issues like that kind of resonate more when they're be, they're personalized um, to yes. the characters in the book and not just uh, you know concepts and that certainly happens in this one and and so couldn't be happier. Yes, well, I think we have some questions from 
our audience. So okay. I'll turn it over to Michaela here. <laughs> yeah, we do indeed. But Lisa, stay on because some might apply to you. Oh, as I'm a- not going <laughs> anywhere. Oh, good. <laughs> <laughs> might apply as a longtime reader as well. So um, I just want to remind audience members and viewers that if you have any questions, a lot of you have already been active in the chat. Use that chat to uh, ask your questions and type them in. Uh, the first one that we have came early in the event, and I quite like it. How did you come by the name Joe Pickett? Oh, that's a good one. Um, you know, it, there's a, a reissue of the first book, Open Season. It's on paperback. And um, when they reissued it, and they're going to do it again because it's 20 years old. Um, I wrote a little forward to it about, you know, creating the character, what it was like. And I mm-hmm. found a notebook page from way back when where I put a bunch of first names and a bunch of last names and scratched them out and ended up with Joe Pickett. Uh, and, and the Joe kind of came from just, you know, I, I, I like the idea of thinking of him as an average Joe. He's no superhero. Mm-hmm. Um, Pickett is actually from uh, the first world champion uh, rodeo cowboy at Cheyenne Frontier Days was a black cowboy named Bill Pickett. Bill Pickett. And he yeah. used to, he was a, a bulldogger, a calf, you know, uh, uh, a wrestler. And he would bring the animals down by biting on their front lip. And there's <laughs> photos of him biting the lip of the uh, cow till it fell over and then he'd win. So it's sort of an homage to him and to Rodeo and to Cheyenne. He was amazing. Yeah. His stories are amazing. What? <laughs> yeah. That movie. Um, <laughs> so I, that's so cool. And I love that you're able <laughs> to find your old scratch chicken scratch of figuring out what name goes with what and I mean it obviously worked because you created such an iconic character um speaking of your writing though uh you do an awesome job at visual writing like Lisa said I can see each scene so clearly that's one of the reasons I read your books how are you how do you do anything special to make it so visual and how did you learn that over time um you know, thank you. That's a great compliment. Uh, sometimes I overwrite descriptions of scenery and then go back later and just start taking out everything that is too much um, until I hone it down till exactly what I want it to be. You know, uh, Elmore Leonard wrote a long time ago, Elmore Leonard's 10 rules of writing. And they're brilliant. They're perfect. And uh, what number one rule is leave out the part readers skip. And what he's saying is huge blocks of text. Readers tend to go right over the top of them to the first line of dialogue. Uh, So and so I keep that in mind. So I know that if I write lots and lots of blocks of text, they're likely to be overlooked and skipped. So those that are in there, I want to make as precise as I can. Um, You know, what does it look like? What is the light like? What does it smell like? How hot or cold is it? very kind of, I always want to put the reader there, even if it's in a comfortable situation, like in dark sky, it's colder than hell um, when they're up there and it's dark and it's in the mountains and the snow's coming down and they don't have the right gear. And I I try to convey that the best I can um, so that the reader feels it as well. That's excellent. On the same topic of writing, um, talking about voice for a character, I feel like it's the best impression of Joe when he when what he looks like, his demeanor by one word, he often utters, yup. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> how do you find a character's voice and how do you keep Joe's for all these years? Um, you know, it's fairly easy. He doesn't talk a lot. Um, he tends to be real, um, again, kind of precise with his language and doesn't go on and on. Um, and that's been since the very, very first book. So that's, it's fairly easy to do to make him kind of low key and, um, you know, not loquacious like some of the other characters in the book. Uh, uh, you know, a very interesting thing about Joe Pickett is that he has never been described physically in any book. Um, the only description of him in 21 books is he was lean and of medium height. That's yep. it. So whatever he looks like is whatever the reader thinks he looks like. Average Joe. Yep. <laughs> I like it. I like it. That's awesome. Um, You talk about your story threads often. Can you talk about your structured approach to writing and how that works? 
Sure. Um, I always start with, uh, like Lisa said, something ripped from the headlines most of the time. Um, but a modern day um, issue or controversy, um, something people are talking about in my part of the world. So I'd start with that issue and then usually okay. something else, um, maybe technological, resource based. So one or two big issues that are going to be explored in each book. And then I do the research on those things. Um, and as much as I can, uh, in dark sky, those two issues, you know, one is social media and the pervasiveness of it. The other is Falcons resmuggling, um, which is an international big deal. Um, it, so I did a lot of research on both of those things when I was comfortable enough with that. Then I do a bullet point outline from basically chapter one. Well, first I do a list of characters reoccurring and new, and then start a bullet point outline from chapter one, all the way to the end. And then I start writing literally on top of that outline when I've got it done. Sometimes the preparation takes quite a long time before I actually commence, but then by, it's, things are figured out. And then I just write on top of that till it's, till, till it's done. Sometimes the ending changes. Sometimes, you know, I take forays that I never intended um, just based on what happened that day. And, and, that, and that's always interesting. You know, um, I remember a few years ago, I had Nate Romanowski getting into a fight with a guy in a fish hatchery and yes. Nate reached down in the water and grabbed a five pound trout and beat the other guy with it. But um, that was it. That was in my outline. But then I thought it's really cold out. Um, so that fish is going to freeze solid. It's going to be like a club. So he uses the club later on on another guy and hits him with a fish. That's the kind of thing that sometimes just comes out of nowhere. I don't know where, but then I like it. But we all I like it. it. <laughs> and we like it too, I'm sure. Um, so I like this one interesting as well. Would you ever consider a solo Nate book one day? I, I've been asked that many times and I've given it some thought, but... Um, <laughs> I don't think so because I, I, what I really like in the books is the interplay between the characters right. and yes. it, the book that, you know, the tension and the, the spotlight shifts among the characters with each book. Um, the book I'm the writing right now, the one that comes after dark sky has more Mary Beth in it than any other novel um, for example. And um, some books belong more to Sheridan. Um, some book, this one, Dark Sky, I think is very much a Joe Pickett book because yeah. I wanted it to be. I thought it was time to just really, like I said, strip it down to the studs and just stick with Joe. Mm -hmm. So by shifting that around, some books are more Nate um, centric than others. Mm -hmm. The next one will be as well. Um, but just to have him on his own, I, I doesn't have as much appeal to me as maybe it does to some readers. That's fair. And you're the one that has to sit down and write them ahead of time. <laughs> yeah. um, but speaking of his daughters, I have enjoyed seeing Joe's girls grow up and I like Sheridan's involvement in this book. I hope we'll be seeing more of them in the future. You kind of answered that, but I thought I'd just confirm it that like, they're such an integral part. They're going to keep being that way. Right. <laughs> That's right. Absolutely. Um, and there've been some books that are more Sheridan, most of them actually, um, some Lucy, some April, um, yeah. who have a, a strong role. I can say in the next book, because I wrote it recently, it occurred, it, it all takes place over Thanksgiving, where all of the girls come home for the first time. Um, they're all together in, in quite a while. And that was fun to write. Oh, fun. That's awesome. Can you talk yeah. about maybe how has your own family or relations or your history helps play into writing those family dynamics as well? Well, I had, I have three daughters as well. Um, they are older than the girls in the books. All three of my daughters think Sheridan is based on them. So, <laughs> <laughs> but a lot of the interaction with the girls, the, you know, the rivalries, some of the snippiness. Um, I, I took a lot of that from, you know, the kitchen table and yeah. um they are also, along with my wife, Lori, my first readers of every manuscript. So they get it immediately. They offer notes. Um, they're very, they're, they're involved in that. You know, they love to tell me I screwed something up or um, I got something wrong. So they read it pretty carefully, but that's really helpful. And I appreciate that. 
yeah. they know the characters better than I do. And sometimes they recognize the same phrase over and over and say, you know, how many gunmetal skies do there have to be, dad? <laughs> that kind of thing. And um, that's helpful. Well, at least they can be honest with you. That's that's something yeah. that not all authors trust their family members to do. So that's that's really great. And after so many novels, that's it's probably old hat by now. <laughs> and my wife, my wife, Lori, is my best editor by far. Yeah. Uh, I really do trust if I get to the end of a book and I think I have an explosive ending and she reads it and goes, eh, you know, uh, maybe something else. Um, she's always, she's, I don't want to say always right, but generally right. Yeah. Well, yeah. I, uh, we're going to travel to setting a little bit now, but of, uh, I was born in Montana, but raised in Colorado. You seem very familiar with both states. Have you spent extensive time in both and do you like one better than the other? Hmm. I have spent, I have uh, spent, extensive times in both um also uh, a lot of time in idaho uh, north dakota south dakota um i used to have a company that did international tourism promotion mm -hmm. uh, to europe scandinavia australia and our job was to uh host uh tour operators and journalists in the rocky mountain west and drive you know take them around drive them around show them mm -hmm. everything so i got to know some areas really well um Montana to me is just Wyoming times two, you know, it's twice, <laughs> twice as big and twice the population, but basically the same kind of format mm -hmm. layout. And I've got a lot of relatives from Colorado and from, or from Montana and from Colorado. So somebody's asking me to say if I like Montana more than Colorado, is that the question? Yeah, um, you don't have to pick. Okay. No. I won't, but I, <laughs> I do like Montana a lot because uh, it, it's very familiar and I've spent more time there, I think. Fair enough. How do you keep your stories fresh after so many years? Well, I think part of that, I hope that, you know, I want it. I, I want somebody to tell me if they don't, if they become stale, because then I'll quit. But Lisa um, and Lori will tell you. <laughs> yeah, yeah, they, yeah, she will. Um, <laughs> It, it, they mainly have to do with the issues in the books because those change every mm -hmm. time. These are not books that, as you know, are just about, you know, a new, a new murder mystery uh, every time. Yeah. How do we solve this, this crime? There's always crime involved, but the books to me are more about the issues and um, the big topics. And right. as long as those are different every time, I think the book will, the book will be fresh. The other thing is um, as the family uh, grows and ages and matures and goes different directions, just like a real family, that means the dynamics change with every book as mm -hmm. people, you know, age, go to college, get a job. Um, that keeps them fresh for me too. They're not static. Absolutely. Exactly. Yeah. Would you ever try your foray into something like movies or screenplays or television shows, writing rather than novels? Uh, I thought, you know, no. I, I thought about that early on. I even... I even wrote a screenplay um, based on the first book, uh, Open Season, just to see if I could do it. And I did it, and I didn't enjoy it one bit. Um, I, 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 I admire people who, who do that, but I think it's a lot more rewarding to actually write the book um, than, than it is the screenplay or the teleplay. There, and the, way, the collaborative way that that is done in real life with um, showrunners and um, you know, five or six people in a writing room, writing collaboratively, um, it does not have any appeal to me at all. I visited a writing room not too long ago when the people who work on the Joe Pickett series and they're all wonderful people, but the way their process is not my process. And I would get too, I would, I would get too frustrated. Fair this enough. way I get to be, when you write your own book, you get to be the God of everything. You don't have there to have any input, you know? Mm -hmm. Yep. And so I think we'll do two more questions here before, before we unfortunately have to end. Um, but how do you come up with your titles for your books? What's that process look like? Um, it's come to very, very many different ways. Sometimes I, I actually have the title before I write the book. That's rare. Usually I start with one um, that my editor might kind of like and then use that until the end. Um, and then maybe we change it. Or, and sometimes I write it, I get a certain phrase or I love to use quotations in the books um, all throughout. And sometimes yes. I get a phrase from those quotes that work for the title. Um, sometimes the title changes for reasons that have nothing to do with the book itself. Um, I've had a 
one that maybe two that I had a title I really loved. And um, the publisher said, you know what, we've got another book with the same name coming out the next month. Yeah. So, you know, that, that kind of thing has nothing to do with the content. And, uh, and sometimes also uh, because the books have gotten big enough, the publishers actually kind of focus group the titles with not only their staff, but with uh, certain readers. And if it doesn't have a lot of appeal, they'll suggest changing it. That's a fascinating process. I didn't know about the, the focus group for titles. And that's, that's been kind cool. of recent, but I didn't know about it either. Yeah. That's awesome. Well, again, we hate the idea of even ending this. And I know there's a lot of excited people watching here right now and us too with, with how enjoyable this has been. But we like to end on this question here at Tatter Cover. And actually it's a question for both of you. Um, for Lisa, for you as a reader and for CJ, you as a writer, what did this book teach you? And uh, that can be interpreted however you want. Uh, but Lisa, I'd love it if you could start and then we could end with our author of the hour. Well, it, it taught me that I will always have bear spray when I go to <laughs> Wyoming um, in my purse. <laughs> no, it taught me, you know, it's, I think all your books have taught me to um, look toward nature a little more and maybe be more adventurous in, you know, where I might want to travel or do even, but definitely I'm keeping the bear spray. That's a good answer. That's a I like that answer, answer Lisa. <laughs> How about for you, CJ? I, I think um, that, that's, a, that's a tough question. Um, I, think, I think one thing I learned with this one is that um, I really like writing Joe Pickett bared down, stripped down um, to, it, to just to him versus nature versus other men. Um, I still, and that was kind of, kind of came from the, the first few books in the series. So it was kind of, it was good to return to that in my mm -hmm. mind. And I, I like the way it all worked out. Well, thank you. And I'm sure that there are other readers who are going to enjoy how it worked out as well. Dark Sky just came out yesterday and you can get your copy at one of our four Tattered Cover locations or online at tatteredcover.com. I want to thank you both for giving us your time this evening, for Lisa, for hosting another fabulous uh, CJ oh, Box event. My pleasure entirely. Yes. And <laughs> CJ, Good to see you, Chuck. Absolutely. Um, I want to give you a chance, CJ, to remind people who you are, where they can find you online, and anything else you want to say before we close out. Well, I love doing I, I love doing events at the Tattered Cover. I remember going to the Tattered Cover myself as a college student in Denver. And um, when the first first time we went back uh, with open season, I remember going up the stairs and there was a sign that said, shh, shh, author, yes. you know, speaking. And I and my wife turned to me and said, shh, shh and I realized it was me you know, uh, and that was such a thrill. Um, so it's always fun. Lisa, thank you again for hosting this. And uh, my thanks, pleasure. Thanks I wouldn't miss everybody. it. <laughs> well, we're, we're really the ones that are gifted here with your continuous years of stories. Thank you so much. And I know the viewers feel that way as well. We're getting lots of thank yous in the chat. Ah, right? great. Good. <laughs> so once again, you guys can get your late, the copy of the latest Joe Pickett novel, Dark Sky at tattercover.com or at any one of our locations. And some people jumped on late. So just so you know, you can use this link to miss any, to watch any part of this live stream that you may have missed once we close out here this evening. So no worries there. Um, thank you guys again. Check out future events at tattercover.com and I'll see some of you in another hour or so <laughs> for our next event. Um, but thank you guys again for shopping locally. For some of you, it's dinner time. Think about ordering from a local mom and pop restaurant. You're the reason that we're still here right now during this crisis in our world. So thank you so much for your generosity over the years. Stay safe, everybody. Happy reading. Thanks, Lisa. Thanks, Michaela. Bye. Thank you. And we're out. Okay. All right. Yay. All right.